All right, here we are, more than half way through the chapters we have to cover. Chapter 11, specifically 11.1, .1, we're going to look at threats to aquatic biodiversity. And right off the bat, let's take a look at a case study, the jellyfish invasion. Now, jellyfish, as we know, are invertebrates, no backbone. They don't really have a brain. They don't have blood as we know it. Just a invertebrate with literally a jelly-like substance making up most of them and tentacles. But we are seeing a lot of jellyfish blooms out there in the ocean. These things can cover areas of over like six blocks of just nothing but masses of jellyfish. Now they're drifters. They can swim up and down a little bit, but they can't really fight against a current. They just go with the currents. And they get in these areas, we get these really large blooms, and we've they have been rising in the past 10 years. Now, this has a huge harmful economic effect a lot of time. It can disrupt commercial fishing as people are trying to go through them. You can't make it through, or the only thing in the nets are obviously jellyfish. Beaches get closed down, so there's some recreational and economic loss because of that if you're in an area that, once again, is harboring tourists for the most part. Ship engines get clogged as they try and go through these areas with these masses of jellyfish. They can get up in the engines, the propellers, causing problems. They can completely wipe out coastal fish farm areas. They come in stinging, killing, and eating about anything that they can uh, get their hands on, get their tentacles on, I guess. They even have been known to block water cooling plants because, once again, we need the water to come into the power plants, cool them off. They get in there, they block up these intakes and then causing massive problems. We'll touch base on some of the reasons why, but some of it is the acidification and warming of the ocean. They survive in more acidic water without any problem. Warmer waters are good for them. So when we get into these dead zone areas, well, they tend to thrive. So even things like these giant lion mane jellyfish, which can be larger than a human. I remember seeing one when we lived in Thailand, just massive, like eight feet across. But these jellyfish blooms are kind of here to stay for a while, and they really can cause issues. Now, when we look at threats to aquatic biodiversity, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter if it's terrestrial or aquatic, HIPCO. <laughs> yeah, you should get tired of hearing it, but it comes up over and over and over. Looking at habitat loss, a lot of times the habitat loss is because of human population growth. But anyway, H, habitat loss, invasive species moving into areas, pollution, because of population growth tends to stir or tends to spur the pollution as well as habitat loss, but then climate change over exploitation. Remember the HIPCO. Habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, population growth, climate change, and over exploitation. This are the primary reasons for virtually any kind of threat, but specifically our aquatics, those are them. Now, guys, we have explored less than 5% of the ocean. 5%, not much. There's some of the surface, but a lot of our shipping lanes just go over certain areas, and obviously we start talking about the depths, a lot of that we have not been to at all. The greatest marine biodiversity that we find are gonna be in the coral reefs, the estuaries, and then the deep sea floor. Biodiversity tends to be higher near the coastline, this littoral zone, so we have the, what the sunlight can hit the bottom, so we get a lot of growth in that. But it also tends to be higher at the very bottom of the ocean because all that dead matter drifts its way down and we have more feeding zones at the bottom. So the open ocean itself, way out to sea, and the surface are our least biodiverse areas. Uh, coral reefs, which are always in shallow waters where it's warm, but near the coastline we get a lot of life. Ocean floor we get a life. Not so much out in the open ocean near the surface. Just when we're looking at 
areas that we find it. So when we're talking about harmful effects or threats to it, well, threats are going to be where the greatest biodiversity is. We're not as worried about threats of the open ocean. There's not as much actually there. Well, why should we care? Outside of an ethics standpoint of, you know, should we or shouldn't we? Well, aquatic ecosystems provide a lot of economic services. There's over 300 million jobs out there in the world that depend on the oceans. And not to mention just the animal protein, the food, the resources. Once again, economic services, sometimes that is just like food that we get from there, and that's a big potential concern. All right, some of these human activities that are threatening it. Well, unfortunately, we really believe we are in a major extinction event right now. And one of those huge extinction events is going on in the oceans. A lot of it with our coral reefs. Once again, this is where we have most of our biodiversity. But we're getting a lot of coral bleaching. When the coral reefs are incredibly sensitive. They have to be where it's clear water, needs to be a certain temperature and clarity so that the things can grow and live there. Well, if the oceans have become getting warmer, the oceans are absorbing most of the heat from global warming, so the ocean temperatures are rising. This, along with a lot of sunscreens and other things that we have, we use when we want to go in and dive down and see the coral reefs, are damaging the algae that live in the coral reefs, and we're getting bleacher. Not to mention the higher acidity. The carbon dioxide in the air hits the water, H2O, CO, we get our H2CO3 for our carbonic acid, driving the acidity levels up in the ocean. All of this combined have begun to do a lot of damage to our coral reefs, and as we see the coral reefs die, we lose a lot of the biodiversity. Also about one fifth of the mangrove forest out there have disappeared or been severely damaged just since the 1980s. We have seen mangrove forests severely get damaged. All of this goes into harmful effects on our aquatic ecosystems, specifically the marine ecosystems. Our fishing, there's been a lot of overfishing, but kind of specifically the dredging of trawlers. These are fishing nets that go down and they anchor and they weigh down at the bottom and they scrape across the bottom, you know, to try and catch the fish down on this feeding zone. Well, as the pictures you can see, we have a, a viable coral and things on the bottom and the trawlers come through and just absolutely wreak havoc on the bottom. In dam building, we're talking aquatic ecosystems, etc. The dam building and the excessive withdrawal of river water threatens the freshwater habitats as well. So we're talking about aquatic ecosystems. It's both. It's just the biggest ones, the greatest damage we're really seeing right now is in the oceans. This is we mentioned about the carbonic acid. The ocean acidification is the other CO2 problem. Carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, greenhouse gas, leading to climate change and global warming. Well, it's also leading to acidification of our oceans. The oceans absorb about one-fourth, about 25% of all of our human-generated CO2. It goes up in the atmosphere. The ocean covers 71% of the ground or the land on Earth and it's dissolving into the ocean. So about 25% of our man-made CO2 gets its way into the ocean. Well, CO2, when it mixes with H2O, forms H2CO3, carbonic acid. This decreases also the carbonate ions. Any kind of shellfish, anything that's creating shells or the corals themselves need carbonate ions in order to make their shells. And the carbonic acid cuts down on the number of carbonate ions in the water, so it's a double whammy. The acidification can even begin to dissolve shells, make them harder to form, and then there's not as much carbonate in the water for them to get which they need to build their shells. So they can't build the shells as quickly, and with enough, some of the shells can actually even dissolve. 
As we look at the picture up here, in the late 1900s, we can see the acidity range. Well, the same thing from our acid base lab earlier in the year. Remember, the down towards purple and blue is basic, green is neutral, and towards the yellow to red is acidic. Looking at projections, by the year 2100, our oceans are going to be largely neutral towards acidic as opposed to being priorly more basic towards neutral. Especially at the poles, you're already getting pretty acidic and this can spell pretty bad news for things living in the ocean. And then we're into invasive species, just kind of working through HIPCO here. Habitat, cutting down on the habitats. Now we're into looking at invasive species. Now invasive species can cut down and degrade entire ecosystems. Once again, for whatever reason, we have an organism here that didn't used to be there. And because of that, a lot of times they don't have natural predators. So these guys are blamed for about two thirds of all fish extinctions since the 1900s, invasive species. Our global trade, ships moving around, contributes a lot of this. Ships take in ballast water, because if they don't have a heavy load, they have to take in water so they sit properly. They take in ballast, then they get wherever they're going, and now they're going to take up a heavy burden. They unload the ballast, let all this water out. They picked it up over here, and they dumped it here, and species can hitch a ride, and they get dumped off. In the Atlantic right now, we're experiencing a lionfish boom. Lionfish have no known predators in the waters out here, and they are taking over all up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States. They reproduce quickly in large numbers. They kind of have spines and thorns around them so other things can't get to them and eat them well. And then they're eating all the food that the other fish normally would get around here. And all of a sudden, huge issue. So invasive species are a huge problem. Carp. Carp, not native to a lot of areas. The pictures up here, you can see the turbidity in that water. It's all cloudy except for that nice, neat little square. What's the difference? Well, they took the carp out of that area. It's an experimental zone. They netted it off, made sure all the carp were out of it, positive them outside, and the turbidity in that area goes way down. The carp were introduced in the 1800s into this particular lake. They eat algae that normally cover on the lake bottom, and now we don't have the algae down in the bottom, keeping the turbidity down, doing some cleansing of it, and the movement by the fish swarming around down on the bottom increase all of the turbidity or the cloudiness in the water. But we remove the carp from this little area, and lo and behold, we see very clearly what happens and what goes on. These invasive species really have a huge impact on whatever kind of ecosystem they wind up moving into. Our population growth and pollution. So when the part of the P, the HIPCO pollution, it's really the P and the P. Population growth, population growth tends to lead to greater pollution. Population goes into both habitat loss and in pollution. So taking a look at it. 80% of all humanity lives near the coastline. It's a crazy number, like within 100 kilometers of the coastline, we 80% of humanity lives. It's not very far. And oxygen depleted zones form in these coastal areas. Well, a lot of that is our fertilizers. Once again, eutrophication. The excess fertilizers makes its way into the water. The water helps the producers, in this case, usually algae grow. And then this decomposition of the algae leads to bacteria coming in and it robs the water of oxygen. No oxygen, not enough for the fish, and we get these huge fish kills coming off. So when we talk about red tide, we're really talking about these oxygen depleted zones, largely because of human growth, excess use of fertilizers running off into our oceans. Also, just toxic pollutants as well as plastics go a long way into hurting and damaging things in the life. 
Not to mention simple overfishing. The fisheries, just a concentration of a particular wild aquatic species that's certifiable or suitable for commercial harvesting, a fishery. So people are in the fishing business because they want to go pat, catch tuna, swordfish, whatever it is people are demanding to want to eat and cod. So we go out and go after this fish. It's a commercial industry. Trawlers. These guys are horrible because of the damage they do to the bottom, like the picture we saw before. But we also get a lot of different types. We'll put the picture up here so you can see the different types that we get. So the trawlers dredging the bottom, per seine, so we get this big seine net catching. And a lot of times we'll get a lot of dolphin kills in there. And there's a lot of just kill to fish they don't really want. We're after a particular type of fish but you get a lot of fish in there. And if they're fish that don't have a marketable value, we just throw them back out in the ocean, even if they're dead or dying. And a lot of our fishing, it kills off a lot. So long lining, long lines where we just put literally miles out of like hooks with bait on it. And large numbers of sea turtles, dolphins, and seabirds get killed this way because we're just out with this long line catching things. And we never know what's gonna bite on the hook. And these things stay out there for a long time, then we pull it in for the catch, and a lot of the things on it are actually dead. Now, we can still eat a lot of these things that have died along the way, but a lot of times, even if they're alive, they're so exhausted, we throw them back in the ocean, that they don't survive. Drift net fishing is where, once again, huge net let out there, drifting coming in. Some of these things can be miles long. We have these huge nets, miles long, trailing to get and once again we don't always know what we're getting we use certain nets to try and catch certain types of fish but there are always lots of other types of fish out there we're not always getting what we want and there's a lot of kill so the recovery time for a lot of these depleted populations is increasing once again if you leave it alone the populations will come back if there's enough of them but we keep taking more and more, and it's taking longer and longer for them to even begin to recover, and it sometimes it becomes almost even impossible for it to occur. So a lot of these large predatory fish are declining, like the tuna, swordfish, etc. This is leading to those jellyfish blooms we talked about. Sea turtles, tuna, swordfish, these are some of the animals out in the ocean that eat the jellyfish. Without them, no predators, the jellyfish populations bloom, classic food web, food chain situation. More and more jellyfish, few predators, more and more jellyfish, fewer predators, and all of a sudden we have an issue or a problem, and the jellyfish take over an entire region. Now with all the jellyfish, they kill off all the other things, and we're left with just the jellyfish. And we're fishing for smaller marine feed species now. We used to get, you know, more and more large size, but now we keep catching smaller and smaller and smaller. We're having to convert to looking for fish meal and fish oil to feed to our farmed fish to have food to survive on. And it just reduces the food for larger fish. So again, predator species, we're taking many of them out. It's going down and down and down. All those different ones we can look at. Not to mention our sea turtles having problems, whether they're caught in nets or the hooks, etc. And once again, not many sea turtles that hatch make it to adulthood. They've been in the ocean for millions and millions of years, but their numbers are now really seriously in danger. The chart we're gonna look at here is one of just overfishing. And this was an aspect of going after codfish in Newfoundland. And you can see in the 60s where the catch peaked, but once again, they caused a crash in the system. We caught so many fish, they weren't able to recover, and the numbers plummeted where the species was all but gone in this area off of Newfoundland. So overfishing, if we're not careful, can lead to crashes in a system. Another one that's interesting in a case study is looking at sharks. We've seen a serious 
dip and decline in the number of sharks. And it's one of these big predatory species. A lot of it comes from shark finning. We catch the shark just to cut off the fins for shark fin soup, which is a delicacy in a lot of parts of the world. And our populations of sharks have been seriously declining. Why do we care? Sharks are a keystone species. They're out, they get the kill, it provides food for a lot of others. Also, they do a lot of cleanup effect. As other animals die, the sharks go in and get it and clean it up. Without the sharks, we have a lot of things that are dead and drift down, and it creates a too much, well, once again, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Dead fish going down to the bottom, some species feed off of them, but too much is causing a problem. We're losing a lot of our predator species, including sharks, and they really are a keystone species protecting the ecosystem, actually. They help maintain the balance. Over 200 million sharks are killed annual. Uh, once again, a lot of times just for the fins, but 25% of the world's sharks right now are threatened with extinction. And these are some of, among some of the least protected animals. Because once again, we get all the, mo the movies and the films and the show about sharks as serious predators, but in reality, we only have a few deaths a year by shark, and usually it's less than 100 people a year that are even getting injured. But they get such bad press, a lot of going after them and killing and trying to remove this monster from the deep is going into their decline. And once again, 25% of them at this point are actually threatened with extinction. Now we have some success stories, for instance, with whales. Whaling was a huge industry for centuries. In the 1970s, the United States stopped all commercial whaling. The only whaling that's allowed to go on anymore is with a few indigenous peoples like the Inuit uh, Eskimos, and the amount of whales they take is uh, virtually insignificant, it's just like a few a year. But all of our commercial whaling ceased in the 70s. But the, estimate of whales killed commercially dropped from 42,500 in 1970 down to about 2,000 in 1914. 42,000 down to 2,000. Most whaling today is actually just done by Japan, Norway, and Iceland. That's it. About the only three countries that do any kind of whaling. So the numbers have come down tremendously, and we have seen an increase in the number of all of these species here. From sperm whale, to great blue whale, to right whale, etc. And the whales have been making a tremendous comeback since the 70s. They're not out of the water yet but it's one of these success stories along the way. Unfortunately, the next case study are the sea turtles, and that's not so good. Sea turtle numbers are down 95%. I'm gonna hear the reasons. Trawler fishing is horrible on the sea turtles because it catches so many of them, they just throw them out, and most of them are dead. Hunting, actual just hunting of them, getting tangled up in fishing nets, not just the trawling nets, but any of our fishing nets are catching just atrocious number of turtles. Beach traffic, artificial light. Once again, when the sea turtles hatch, they head towards the brightest area. This used to always be the ocean because of the moon. The moon reflected off the ocean and they headed towards the ocean. Well, now we have so many bright lights, various places, a lot of turtles that are hatching aren't even making it to the ocean and pollution, as we've seen in a lot of various uh, pictures and things before. But of the sea turtles we have here, of the like eight or so known species, or seven, six of them are actually endangered at this point. But we only have seven really known species of sea turtle, six of them are on the endangered list. Once again, down by 95% for some of these reasons. And I know a lot of us seen some of the pictures with them trapped in nets and et cetera before. This is a really great example of one escaping. Some of these nets have been provided with some sea turtle escape hatches, if you will. So as the turtles get in, but then down at the bottom, they have these little gaps where the turtles can make their way out. 
So we're trying to adapt some technology that can help, and there are some things that we can do. We just need to do a lot more. Guys, that's it for this one. Take care, and we will see you next time when we talk about protecting and sustaining our marine biodiversity. Take care. Have a good one.